fucking awesome Come on It's gonna be fucking awesome You know the words It's gonna be fucking awesome That's it, say It's gonna be fucking awesome Howdy, 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 my fellow Cool Geeks. It is I, uh, Jesse Glenn Snyder, the Cool Geek Alive. Now, honestly, oh, I have so many fucking things that I want to comment on right now. Like, just insanity going on. The least of which is freaking George Lucas. Judasing himself on behalf of Bob Iger and what's been going on with his company. I'll just say briefly, because I'm going to talk, I think, about just a lot of things. Um, maybe on next week's show, do a little collection of like all the shit that's been going on. Cause it's like, it's kind of nutty. <laughs> Some of the ridiculous doubling down that's happening, um, in, uh, <laughs> in Hollywood, um, as the audience repudiates the thing. Look, I've always been about the audience. I'm a people pleaser. So for me, there was things that pleased me and you know that that I liked and made me feel like I wasn't alone and that was a big thing you know I was felt very like alone in the world and the Muppets for me was a huge huge one and uh, comedy films were huge for me I watched tons of comedy films and The Princess Bride was my favorite movie of all time and is my favorite movie of all time and I got um turned on to the fact that there was a book after my dad read it and he loved it and he said you should read this book you'll love it and uh and I was at that age you know I had I had struggled with reading because I had an over focus problem and when I would like sit and read I would my eyes would start to water and stuff like because I was like uh trying too hard or something uh so I got like some glasses to correct it for a little while but I wasn't like super into reading. Um, but when I read The Princess Bride, I was just like, yes, this is so much better than the movie. And this like proves the value of books to me. Um, so I started reading a lot more after that. And the first thing that I read, and, and, I'll, and I'll say admittedly, I don't remember so much of this stuff, except for some of the things that I read twice. Um, but... I went out and I bought like, I don't know, almost a dozen uh, William Goldman books. And um, I read, I don't know, at least like eight of them. But um, maybe of that eight, I didn't finish two of them or something like that. You know, like I was like, never never quite went back to them. And I had a fire and I lost um, my books. So even things that I was holding on to that I was going to read eventually. Like I still had some of these books that I had um, picked up uh, by him because I was you know, looking, I, I trusted him as a writer and, um, and, uh, that's, uh, that's what I did for a little while reading, uh, novels. I also read, you know, at that time, the Hobbit and, um, I forget some other fantasy and science fiction things. I'm trying to think if I've read those now, like say, cause recently I, I, I'd, I'd put, I'd loaded up my, um, what do you call it? Tablet with a whole bunch of uh, classics that I always wanted to read, and uh, I, but I just kind of kept reading Treasure Island. <laughs> I still haven't fed it, finished it because I really like it. Treasure Island's really good, <laughs> and I, I kept rereading it because I was like, oh, I, well, whatever, I'll start from the beginning because it's not it's not like super super long. And I started reading the Christmas Car uh, uh, George Dickens a Christmas Carol at Christmas, but I haven't finished that either. I'm the worst with novels. That's why I read comics because <laughs> I can finish a comic. <laughs> And I feel like, generally speaking, good comic book writers, you know, like there's a beginning, middle, and end, so you get like some sort of story, and then like you know, I don't have to remember everything if I if I don't come back to it like immediately because I forget. I just absorb so much information. It's amazing the stuff that I remember, and then the stuff that I struggle with, like titles and different things. But like I'll remember like a ton of different ridiculous actors' names and like all this, all this, all these teams that all these characters have been on and whatnot. It's 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 stupid. <laughs> My memory is like really selective. Well, anyway, um, these were some of the earliest bits of 
like fiction that I read, I really consider William Goldman um, my teacher as a writer. Um, he wrote so many books on um, screenplay writing and stuff like that. I only read a little bit of um, some of his nonfiction stuff because he, it was focused on screenplay writing. And I, when I started to really think about writing, um, I wanted to write fiction, uh, comic books, and uh, and well, first I was thinking about novels and comics, and um, and a lot, a lot of his nonfiction was focused on screenplay stuff. So, but I did read some of that stuff as well, because um, he's my idol, and I'll I'm gonna show you why in a second. Because there's so many other wonderful things by him, not only the books that he wrote, but the films that uh, some of the books are some of his books are are based on. Um, and, um, and because he was coming from the novel world, he was trusted by so many different huge writers to adapt their work. And, you know, if you go in some of these people, I'll mention, you know, I made a bunch of notes for, for different things. Um, I've got like a list of 13, but like most of my 13 have like additional pieces to, you know, the 13, whether it's extra recommendations or you know, reasons why it's significant and awesome. And, and he is significant and awesome. This man won an Oscar for best adapted screenplay and for best original screenplay. And his best original screenplay was adapting the real life of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which is fucking awesome. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, William Goldman was really like a major part of my formative years. Um, but it's like some of my earliest earliest reading so like i f f forgive me for shit that i'm gonna be like i don't remember that exactly but um i'm focusing mostly on the stuff that i remember the most and have gone back and rewatched the most and uh and and that's the and that's the bottom line anyway um i love this man I, uh, you know, next to Jim Henson, he's probably the most influential uh, writer in my life. Uh, he's influenced so many different people, and I'm gonna mention various things. Uh, th I've got a whole bunch of cool notes notes about him, and um, and it's funny. I had some things pulled up from last week. I think they're still pulled up here too. So I'll, yeah, William Goldman. I got some stuff over here. So let's say I'll try to pull up all this shit by the time that we end this shit because William Goldman is really worth your time. So the first one on my William Goldman list is Ghost in the Darkness. And um, it's an adaptation, I believe, of a book. I didn't make any notes about it because I just want to talk about how fucking great the movie is. Um, it stars Val Kilmer. It's Val Kilmer in his prime. Um, it is uh, Morgan Freeman's in it as well. And it is really awesome. Um uh, it, it's just super well done. If you love animals and, you know, especially like predatory animals, cats, it's just cool and visceral. And I love a good monster movie and the monsters, these, these man eating lions, um, where they're working on these railroad tracks and they bring in this guy to, um, you know, kind of get it under control and he can't get these lions under control. And it's really just a, a visceral thriller with, with lions. It's fucking awesome. Um, highly recommend that one. Um, number two stars one of my other favorite actors, uh, Mel Gibson, in his prime uh, in Maverick, which I, I'm not sure if I remember correctly if it's an adaptation of a TV series or a film. I think a TV series. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure the TV series because his father is, well, oh shit, I don't, I don't want to spoil things in the movie, um, but is played by uh, James Gardner, I think that's the dude's name, who's freaking awesome. Um, and, um, they have great chemistry, him and Mel Gibson and Jodie Foster's in it. And she really, it, it's, it's great. And it's like, it centers around gambling and, uh, you know, the old West and, um, Mel's charming as hell and James Garner's charming as hell. Um, it was almost like, I hear you're pretty charming, Mel. Well, let's, let's, we'll have a little charming contest. Uh, it's a great movie. It's a charming script. Very fucking fun. I've rewatched that movie so many times. I used to put it on in the background all the time. Ghost in the Darkness, too. I, I rewatched those films all the time. They're fucking awesome. Number three, um, one of the movies he won an Oscar for, he did not enjoy the process of working on this movie. Um, he said something to the effect that he'd written... Uh, never written more drafts for anything. Apparently, the studio just kept having him adjust and adjust and adjust this script. Um, but they won an Oscar. 
uh, for all the president's men. And it is great. It stars Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. And um, you'll see, you can follow a chain of great actors in so many of the movies that uh, that he makes. You know, I got introduced to Robert Redford through uh, the work of William Goldman, and I love Robert Redford. Really enjoy all sorts of Robert Redford movies. He's awesome. And uh, better than Robert Redford is Paul Newman. Oh God, I love Paul Newman. He's my gay, my gay crush. Like you know, I'm not you know not that <laughs> you know just, but I love him. I I like I I'll, I'll watch any Paul Newman movie. I think he's so cool, and uh, so charming, um, and um, and he's also a good dude. Got into racing cars later in his life, and uh, you know the Newman's own charity. You know that's a charitable. When you buy that salad dressing, it's a charity. It goes to to good cause and like. Uh, he really like did good things in his life, like that guy, um, and um, so him, you know, as actor in in so many of these movies, he did a lot of William Goldman movies, and um, and 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 the, and Dustin Hoffman as well, as you'll see. Um, so all the president's men, uh, you know what? I don't want to. I'm I'm gonna go vague with it because I don't remember the exact details of it, and I think I've only watched it twice, even though it's it's awesome. But it's a real life movie, and I tend to, you know, kind of have my takeaways from those things, and maybe I'll go back at a certain time and watch it again. Um, but I again, it was when I was younger that I that I was like these were some of like my early like cinephile films watching these things, so it's a little a little little far back for me. Um, but um, all the president's been is essentially about these two newspaper guys exposing uh, a story. And I don't remember if it was freaking Watergate or uh, it might have been Watergate. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's great. And uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford are awesome together. The way this, the, this, the, the, the pacing of it and just the suspense of it and the way it's told, it's, it's really, really awesome. A movie worth checking out, you know, Oscar winning best adapted screenplay. And, you know, we talk about good adaptation all the time. And William Goldman was often um, adapting things that um, were said to be unadaptable and they would bring him in and he would read the book and then he would go, all right, you know, here's my adaptation and um, and people love that stuff so much that they would work with him again as you'll see um, so at number four I got a little bit of a cheat here but I love this movie and he was slightly involved and it gives me an excuse to talk about all the different movies that he was slightly involved in and it's uh, John Cleese um, and company's fierce creatures which is fucking awesome. I don't know if you've ever seen Fierce Creatures. Probably more likely have seen a movie called A Fish Called Wanda. A Fish Called Wanda is awesome. Fierce Creatures is equally awesome in different ways. Um, I highly recommend Fierce Creatures. It's very, very funny and um, stars a lot of the uh, original Python uh, members in great roles and um, basically takes place at a zoo with a new uh, head zookeeper person who gets brought in to like get things under control and i forget the, what exactly is like going wrong i think kevin klein's in it in a part i love kevin klein um in a um part um if you're seen in and out with kevin klein that's a funny movie watch in and out that's funny um uh extra homework assignment watch in and out with kevin klein um, Kevin Klein's awesome, uh, and and you I, you love Kevin Klein if you've seen a fish called Wanda, and he's got a part in here, and I think he plays like both the young idiot son and the old man who are like trying to basically destroy the zoo in one way or another. But uh, John Cleese is trying to fix the zoo because that's what he's been hired to do, um, kind of thing. But it it is very funny, and I can't remember some of the premises. Oh yeah. Well, they, 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 all these rumors begin to get started about him because of all these various situations that keep being uh, happening, where like he's walking out of places with animals and women, and um, you know, and people are starting to presume all these things, and it's and it's going badly for that reason, but it's also going well for that for that reason. There's some real. It's it, it's great, good movie. Um, and um, so fierce creatures. He was a, g consulting. Uh, on you know and then on uh, consulting could be a lot of things he he talked at length about consulting on goodwill hunting with Matt Damon uh and um and uh 
Ben Affleck. And he dissed the movie a little bit, like a couple aspects. He's like, I wouldn't have written this and I wouldn't have written that because they were trying to credit the movie to him. They were trying to take the credit away from them. And he basically said, ah, they're just trying to take away the credit from these these handsome guys. Um, you know, but uh, he's like, if they wanted to keep writing like you know they'd be they'd be great and like they are great uh, and they are great ben affleck has demonstrated he's very talented um uh, i mean and matt damon's deeply talented as an actor but i, I think ben's really demonstrated uh, some depth uh, beyond that i think he's written some more things too um so um uh, amongst uh, William Goldman's consulting and uncredited work, and you can go sort this out uh, if you want to investigate him further, and you should if you're interested as a writer. He's really a good person to study. Um, he did uh, consulting and uncredited work on Twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, uh, A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson and Tom Hanks, no, uh, Tom Cruise and um, Demi Moore, uh, Papillion. Uh, I forget who's in that movie, but uh, it's a great war movie. Uh, Extreme Measures, uh, which was based on Michael Palmer's book, and uh, Aaron Sorkin's Malice. Aaron Sorkin's a great writer. Uh, Last Action Hero as well, which movie sucks, but it's true. <laughs> um, moving on to number five, there's a movie called The Hot Rocks. Um, Hot Rocks is great. It's um, It's just a comedy heist movie. Kind of, um, you know, some Ocean's Eleven vibes. Robert Redford's in it. There's um, an old school cast of a lot of good actors, good comedic actors that uh, whose names um, I wouldn't know off the top of my head. I can see their faces in my my mind, um, but they're kind of just like of their time. But uh, but it's great. It's a really great movie. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, the Hot Rocks has introduced me to. Um, uh, Robert Red uh, Robert Redford and um, I've never got around to seeing it, but uh, there's a movie that I've been dying to see called The Great Waldo Pepper, that uh, is also written by William Goldman and stars um, uh, Robert Redford. I almost have watched it multiple times. <laughs> it like starts off really like sleepy, so a couple times I put it on, I was like I just kind of fell asleep, and then like it disappeared from streaming or whatever. But I've I've been meaning to watch it, and um, apparently. Um, uh, William Goldman also did some consulting work on Indecent Proposal, which um, was another uh, Robert Redford movie. Um, do, 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 do. At number six, we've got Marathon Man, which um, <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those cases of uh, one of my first uh, introductions to, ah, man, this movie sucks compared to the book. Because <laughs> I had read the book first because this was like the one that I had heard about um, there's a reference in Gremlins 2 which is one of my favorite movies of all time uh, if you don't love Gremlins 2 you just like you, you're, you're just missing you're just missing all the layers of awesome depth to that movie that movie is great <laughs> and like if you don't see the depth like you really need to like watch it man because there's the humor is quite layered in there it's really great <laughs> I love that movie um, and they make a reference um, with the the Daffy uh, Gremlin. He's like he goes. Uh, he's got the dental stuff, and the guy's tied to the chair. And he goes, "Is it safe?" Uh, and that's a reference to Marathon Man. So my dad had seen Marathon Man. Um, so uh, he had uh, basically because I said, "Like, do you know any other William Goldman?" things or whatever or like I think we looked at the book list or whatever and he said oh Marathon Man that's like a famous movie with Dustin Hoffman so that was one of the main uh, books that I got I got that one and I got the sequel um, Brothers which was good too I don't remember that one as much I'm pretty sure I finished that um, but I remember Marathon Man better because I read it twice um, and I remember when I watched the movie I was just sort of like oh fuck this movie <laughs> <laughs> it was still good and it was cool to see like certain things and stuff but compared to the book it was definitely just like a big letdown so i would say uh, people love marathon man the film and, and it is it, it is good i could appreciate it on a lot of levels um but as somebody who had read the book i was just like this is a major letdown um but the cool thing about the book is it's, you know, it's a series. It's only, you know, two books long, but um, Marathon Man uh, and Brothers was really cool. And uh, essentially, Marathon Man was just like a regular dude getting sucked into this world of espionage that he knows nothing about, um, you know, via his brother. 
um and um and the first one really uh just like the first one's the best the second one's cool just because the first one's awesome <laughs> but uh but they they're really well written william goldman's just a really great writer um you know he's got a great voice i have a hard time often with a lot of novel uh, novelists their their writing voices is very boring to me and like if you're too up your ass as like a writer, I just, I can't stand it. You know, I get people who like Stephen King. Horror is not necessarily my thing, so I haven't gravitated towards a lot of Stephen King uh, things, though I read like his book on writing, because, you know, I, I and, and I have read some Stephen King. I don't, I don't think I finished, one. I, def, I finished a couple of his books. I can't remember which ones they were. So the Stand, I know that I read a bunch of The Stand, and I liked that one a lot, but I didn't finish that one. There was there was one there was one that I read. My dad read a lot of Stephen King, so there was the books around the house. So I remember I, at some point, I picked one up that I really ended up liking. Or maybe I read, um, The Green Mile was one of them, because I liked the movie so much. But it's different, a lot different. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting though to see the differences in the adaptation. It's really worth it if you're a writer to read the books and the movies and just you know just to see and compare and contrast especially if it's ever something that you think that you want to do because there's just a lot to learn from um you know because people do make wonderful grand improvements to narratives you know i would say uh v for vendetta is a great improvement on the book uh written by alan moore and alan moore is one of the greats but um the film built upon the foundations that were laid there by alan moore and it was better for it because it really honored the source so so well um similarly the crow the james obar crow the first film um i mean honestly there's not a lot there except for some real great foundational stylistic things and and the fundamentals of the story but they bring out all the fundamentals of that original james obar story in such wonderful ways they've yet to replicate it with any of the other crow movies besides that first one but brandon lee i mean granted he's kind of magical but i mean the bad guy cast in that movie is amazing the dude from the warriors and my buddy lawrence mason i'm actually friends with that actor the guy who plays tintin uh shout out to lawrence mason what up brother um and uh, and there's a bunch of them the dude who plays fun boy and like they're all freaking creepy in their own way and then that the bad guy the main bad guy and his witchy assistant and like dude that movie's loaded with cool people and tony todd's in there there's it's a great cast um you know there's some magic that they brought to life and from the source material not you know so great um and um and some you know sometimes that happens um uh, but the princess bride's better than the movie and marathon man's better than the movie and there was another one that i had read that was better than the movie i'm forgetting it maybe i'll remember as i get through get to that thing i have lists up here i'll pull up a couple of them and it'll remind me um too many titles and stuff at once in my brain when i was making this list um so marathon man's cool and i i really would recommend the book and uh the the two books and they're not like insane length or anything i think they're like 300 pages and 200 pages something like that um but uh i enjoyed both of those and those were like saved on my bookshelf as like you know one one day i will read these again you know because <laughs> i get rid of the stuff that like i'm not going to read again or things that like i liked but um i wouldn't necessarily read again so i pass them on to pe other people so they can read them um and, and then also I, I like loan out the books that i love so much and then i end up having to buy them again because i never get them back you have that problem Let's see. So I talked about the Hot Rocks. I talked about Marathon Man. And now we're going to talk about number seven. And really, number seven, I kicked it back a little bit to, to maybe some degree. But no, I, I didn't really. Because I, I, these other ones, I, I would say I, I watch more and I've experienced more. Um, the Hot Rocks, I've watched maybe like three times, but it's been a while. I love that movie. I just like haven't seen it in a, in, in a bit, but that's a funny one. I just, I, I really like heist movies, and it's a heist movie, but with a lot of comedy in it. I keep wanting to say Don Rickles is in it. Somebody like that. Somebody, a, 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 a funny old school comedian is in it, like a bigger one is in it too. And it might be Don Rickles. Um, 
So Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is great, especially because it's based on real life people. The the stories, if you look into um, him, is awesome. Like there's a great uh, story that doesn't make it into the movie. It might be in a deleted scene, but um, I remember having William Goldman tell, telling the story or talking about it or whatever, um, was that um, basically Paul Newman's character of Butch, he was Robin Banks in a certain state. And uh, he was brought before the judge, and he made a deal with the judge that he wouldn't rob in their state anymore because he kept escaping and robbing again, escaping and robbing again. So he basically said, like, look, if I don't rob here anymore, are we we good? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, and the judge let him off the hook, and he left that territory, and he never robbed there again. And, um, and Butch was the brains, and Sundance was the killer. And, um, you know, who's backing them up and they were best friends and, uh, you know, they went down in a blaze of glory together uh, in Bolivia, I'm pretty sure. Um, and the only thing about this movie that I should warn you, in the middle of it, there is a musical interlude with like a Burt Bacharach song um, of raindrops keep falling on my head. And it's like uncomfortably long. <laughs> it's, like, it's like six minutes or something. you gonna be like, all of a sudden it's going to come out and you'll be like. What is happening right now? Why is Burt Bacharach here playing raindrops keep falling on my head? Is this a riding a bicycle montage? <laughs> yes, yes it is. Um, you know, you might think it's sweet. I thought it was really weird. <laughs> I was loving the movie. Then that happened and I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> And then after that was over, I was like, oh, okay, thank God. It's over. Uh, I can only imagine that that was what William Goldman was thinking when he fucking saw the movie. He writes this awesome Western about these real people. And in the middle of the movie, this fucking director makes a burnt Bacharach raindrops keep falling on my head music video. It's really funny. You'll be laughing now when you watch, when you watch it. It's so funny. And for this, they cut out the scene where he makes the deal with the judge and other great real life Butch Cassidy moments. The fucking hacks. <laughs> I bet William Goldman was not happy about that shit. I wonder if there's any quotes. I've never seen a quote. Maybe he was, he decided to be diplomatic about that one because he did win an Oscar. <laughs> Of course, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid won, a, won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. It's well-deserved. The movie's great. Um, it's just that that scene in the middle is just like hysterical. Um, all right, number eight. We got A Bridge Too Far, which has a crazy cast. And I mean, William Goldman had a crazy cast from most of his movies. I mean, it's just like like from the very first movie that he ever did, which I, I, I've never gotten around seeing this one. I always wanted to watch it based on one of his books, I'm pretty sure. Um, Soldier in the Rain, uh, which starred Jackie Gleason and Steve McQueen. So, like, I mean, he really, like, was, like, there's so many great actors in his, some of, the, like, the movies that you're tied to. Like, you're in for a treat. Like, like dude has made great movies and, like, with great people. Um, so, Bridge Too Far is great. It's a, it's, um, it's a war movie. Uh, I remember how I used to explain to people that, um, uh, I learned about World War II from watching Patton and A Bridge Too Far because, um, if I'm remembering correctly, um, Patton was sort of diverted by the U.S. military to kind of do something useless, seemingly useless, because the Germans thought for sure that we would send Patton, our best general, to do, you know, whatever the Americans were going to do, they were going to do it with Patton. So basically, they were like double team and Patton. If you're an athlete, you know, like make sure Pat we got Patton. So all eyes were on Patton, and then they had this other squad. While all eyes were on Patton, go and do this other mission that was really the mission to save the day and end the war. You know, because actually, like if you don't know this, and it's unfortunate, the war was over by the time we dropped the bombs on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The Japanese had surrendered days earlier and the Germans had surrendered with this uh, bridge too far maneuver. Um, 
And uh, so it's cool, cool way to learn about history. And this movie is just loaded with like every fucking actor of the day from the 70s and the 60s and the 50s. So if that's anything that uh, is cool for you, like you'll see like so many big actors in it. Um, I was going to like pull it up and make a list, but I'm just like, there, there's so much for me to talk about. There's it no need for me to like name everybody. Um, but there's tons. Tons, tons, tons. I'm pretty sure Rob Redford is one of the people in there with a little cameo. Uh, what did I write? Crazy cast. His career started with so yeah. Okay. Um. All right. At number nine, there's a, a a great book that I had read, and I don't really remember it. Um. But I read I read this. I remember was uh, was one of the ones that I read by him. It was cool. Uh. It was called Heat, and um. I haven't gotten around to watching uh, the new one, but I again I'd watched the Burt Reynolds uh, version of Heat. Uh, I don't remember it very well. It's again, it's like a really early one for me, and I, I I didn't watch it again. I didn't like it as much as Marathon Man or whatever, but it was cool. Um, I was trying to remember what the basic premise of Heat was. It was a, it was again, it was a card thing, um, and the dude was like a bodyguard, um, uh, getting into trouble in Vegas. And they made a remake now with uh with Jason Statham called Wild Card, um, which I want to watch because uh because it. it, it Everything that I've ever watched by William Goldman was great, but I'm somebody who's like always moving forward and like, you know, the things I remember, the things I remember. So like it, but it, it was good. I remember the book being good and, um, and, uh, and I remember the Burt Reynolds movie being good, but I haven't watched the Jason Statham one. So I would recommend that one. Um, then at number 10, you've got Misery. If you never watched that, um, you know, uh, the, the, she's got Kathy Bates has got the guy locked in the bed. And um, it's just a classic. It's based on Stephen King's book. Um, I think that was one of the books I read from my dad's library. Um, and uh, it's a really great adaptation. You know, this was considered something that was non-adaptable for a really long time. Um, you see that said, you know, and like it's like one of the popular things that comes up over and over again when you're reading about uh, William Goldman. Um, and um, there's so many things like in comics all the time that's the thing it's like you can't adapt this and clearly anything can be adapted you know that movie uh did really well i don't know if that won any awards um but um you know very acclaimed film misery um and uh, if you've never seen misery you should really check it out uh, you're basically like a fan of this person is kidnaps him and has him chained to a bed and it's uh, it's it's awesome. Great performances all around, and uh, the 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 what's the word? The satisfaction, I guess, that you would say that uh, Stephen King felt for uh, William Goldman's adaptation of Misery led to them having a lifelong friendship. Um, led to uh, him having um, getting name dropped a whole bunch of times in a great, uh, funny way in the back of uh, the extra chapter of The Princess Bride, which is awesome. Um, and, um, he just kind of uses him as a character in this wild fake world that he's created of, you know, the book not being written by him and being written by S. Morgenstern, having to deal with the Morgenstern estate and, um, fucking, uh, Stephen King being a better option. They're, they're going to Stephen King instead. And very, very funny tongue tongue in cheek kind of shit. Um, it's funny that, that I just read recently again. Um, Oh, sorry. I've been sick. Uh, uh, sorry, this like past week. So I've been just like a little bit like slow. So forgive me if I'm like, I keep like, uh, I gotta like gather myself and my, 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 my brain's not here today. But uh, this is why I made myself a whole bunch of notes today. This is why I, we do these things. Um, so, do, 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 do. Um, so anyway, Stephen King brought him back multiple times. And, um, and not that uh, these were necessarily my favorite, but um, he did um, adaptation of Hearts of Atlantis, uh, which was okay. Uh, and he did adaptation of Dreamcatcher, which I really didn't like Dreamcatcher, but whatever. Um, I wouldn't recommend that one, but Misery's great. Um, and uh, some uncredited work on uh, Dolores Claiborne, which I never saw that one. Um, but, uh, you know, really misery is the one that, you know, is worth seeing. Um, I saw it a long time ago now when I was a kid, but I, I think I watched one with my parents and it's like, I don't like those movies that make you like so uncomfortable. It's for, this is very effective. It's a very good movie. I mean, like, you know, it's like you go like, that was very good. <laughs> that movie made me feel things that I don't like feeling. Um, and if you've never seen the original misery, ugh. I think is it James Caan is he the actor that's the the main the the male 
at the character. Uh, I could, like I said, I'm, I'm fucking cloudy today. All right. So at number 11, um, I had to put in a mention for Stepford Wives. I've watched Stepford Wives again a long time ago. It's a creepy movie. It's based on a book. Um, and um, you know, it's very effective, but it's 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 one of those movies that again made me uh, made me feel very creepy. I'm not a big horror guy, so like I reluctantly like read these things. Like I never watched the magic movie that we're gonna talk about in a second, but I did read the book, and the book's really good. Um, but I'm not like generally a big horror guy, um, so like a lot of the movies like make me creep me out, and like I only watched a lot of these once <laughs> in my life because they were they were creepy to me. Um, Stepford Wives is creepy. Like everybody's getting turned into like robots. It's kind of like invasion of body snatchers, and um, but uh, a lot of people love it. Um, it, it. It's a classic, so it's uh, I put it on the list, and I, you know I've seen it. it, it it's good. I, I, I don't. I'm not like shit talking it. Um, but um, there's other horror thrillers uh, that he's won the Edgar Allan Poe Award uh, for. Uh, one is Harper, which is a Paul Newman movie. Which I don't know if I watched it at like the wrong time or something like that, but like that one didn't like knock my socks off. But it did win the Alan Go- a- a- Edgar Allan Poe Award. Um, I love Paul Newman, so so maybe give that guy a chance because I feel like I want to watch it again. Because I, again, I, like I don't fucking remember it, but I don't remember loving it. And when I saw that it had won an award, I was like, oh, I, wa- I, I I watched that. I don't remember thinking it was great. Um, and Magic, I haven't watched. Uh, there's a, a movie version of it. I w- I really love the magic book. It's about like a, a creepy, uh, a dummy, a, a puppet, and you know I like yeah I like puppets, <laughs> and uh, like uh, I, 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 I I don't want to get all the fucking like details wrong or whatever. But basically, it was it, it was just like, you know, it was like a possessed doll and like, you know influence and like you know your friends can influence you and shit and like it was good as creepy um i always felt uh similar because of the book uh because of magic um the uh the ventriloquist in batman the animated series i always liked that character similarly i think i like imprinted some of the things from magic onto uh the ventriloquist um so that was cool um of just because it was like there was a whole book read about kind of somebody who was like under the same spell, possessed of this fucked up, uh, you know, this fucked up dummy that was telling him to do all these terrible things. Um, yeah, magic was cool. Uh, like I said, I've only read the book though uh, on magic, so like I, I didn't put it on the list, but I figured like I was trying to like condense a bunch of things down because uh, there's some things that I watched but necessarily, I wasn't necessarily a huge fan of, but I figured like I could mention them under some circumstances because they're adaptations and different things. Um, and then there were things that I really liked. And Stepford Wives is like considered like a really big deal, but like magic I don't feel like is is like really well known. And when I saw that it was running Edgar um, Allan Poe Award, I got I to gotta, I gotta watch it. Uh, Especially now that I, I I don't really remember the the book very well, I'm sure I'll be like, oh yes, <laughs> of any little thing that reminds me of the book. Um, so at number twelve, you've got Chaplin, which you know is based on the book written by Charles Char- uh, Charles Charles Chaplin Charles Chaplin Charlie Chaplin Chaplin the the guy, the guy the funny guy with the black and white and the thing. Um, so this again is an adaptation by William Goldman. Um, you know, it's a big, uh, breakout thing for, uh, Robert, Robert Jenny Jr. I ever watched, um, it the one time, but, um, but I, I really remember liking it very much. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's other ones like the chamber, which was an adaptation of John Grisham. Um, and, uh, the general's daughter, which I enjoyed the general's daughter, which was an adaptation of a book by Nelson DeMille or DeMille. Um, but that's cool. And then uh, additionally, he's worked with some incredible um, directors and people specifically. Um, uh, my number 13 is Absolute Power with Clint Eastwood. Um, uh, Clint's awesome. You know, he's such a great filmmaker. Clint has such a great body of work. And Absolute Power is a great movie as well. Um, I realized that they did Memoirs of an Invisible Man with John Carpenter. And I saw that on some lists uh, as a recommend. And um, I was, I was uh, kind of 
blown away that I hadn't put those things together that I hadn't realized it was a John Carpenter movie and given it a chance because um, I just I don't know I always thought the Invisible Man thing was kind of stupid but I watched some of the remakes recently and I thought they were actually really good and it inspired me I was like oh there's some cool things that you can do with the Invisible Man concept um, but anyway I, you know those ones are, are the ones to check out you know Ghost in the Darkness Maverick All the President's Men Fierce Creatures The Hot Rocks Marathon Man Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, A Bridge Too Far. Um, we're going to say Heat or Wild Card. Um, we're going to say Misery. We're going to say Stepford Wives and Magic and also Harper. And we're going to say Chaplin and Absolute Power. And um, I think maybe with you should join me in checking out uh, The Invisible Man, uh, Memoirs of the Invisible Man, because I'm going to check that one out, freaking John Carpenter. Um, and um, and yeah, you know, th th those are the big ones that I can recommend and that I've watched a ton of myself. But additionally, there's some really cool things never produced. Um, William Goldman wrote a script for Mission Impossible 2, which wasn't used. I fucking hate Mission Impossible 2. I really like all the Mission Impossible movies for the most part, but Mission Impossible 2 sucks ass. <laughs> and they should have used William Goldman's script. Guaranteed would be better. Um, and then also, um, William Goldman did an adaptation, an adaptation of Shazam in 2003 um, based on the Captain Marvel comic books. And I bet he would have done a great job at that. And I, 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 I really like might seek out a script online and see if I could find it because I think that would be really cool. Now, in nonfiction, he's written a bunch of stuff, and I'm just gonna kind of read these guys off because these are some of the things that you can uh, read, especially if you're looking at screenplay writing because that's like most of his books, um, not most of them, but uh, are half of his books are um, like books of screenplays. Um, so there's a book called The Goodbye Look, the New York Times book review. Um, so no, and that's that's him um, doing some book review. And he did the season, a candid look at Broadway. That was him. He, he really liked Broadway. He did a little bit of Broadway work, um, like writing some stuff. I've never seen any of that stuff. I'm not familiar with it because um, I'm not a big Broadway guy. But I'm sure it's great. He's a great writer. Um, the Story of a Bridge Too Far, which was like a guide and some of that bit. Um, sure, there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of research and stuff that went into writing that book. And um, do, 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 do. okay, Adventures in the Screen Trade. This was um, this was one of the books that I read. Adventures in the Screen Trade: A Personal View of Hollywood and Screenwriting. And which lie did I tell? More Adventures in the Screen Trade. I think I read actually. Which lie did I tell? More Adventures in the Screen Trade. Trade. Um, and this is just like so many just. Um, practical stories about working in Hollywood kind of stuff um, this is one of the reasons why I, I, I moved on to like other writing uh, things like uh, books that I would recommend for writing if you're not a um, screenplay uh, person um, is um, well you know what I'm just going to focus on the one uh, Wired for Story just by Wired for Story It'll be the best book that you ever buy on writing, any type of writing that you do. Um, but screenplay writing, if you are doing specific screenplay writing, I do think that William Goldman stuff really does still hold up, and especially um, the screenplays. Uh, the other one that I read from him was... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. It was four screenplays, Marathon Man, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, The Princess Bride, and Misery with an essay on each. Um, so, uh, you know, Marathon Man, I'd read the books. I'd read the, because um, he did his own adaptation of these works as well. So these are really good things to like to to learn from. Um, <clears throat> well, for me especially, because I was, I, I was very familiar with Marathon Man. I was very familiar with The Princess Bride. Um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was something that he was taking from the real world and ad adapting. So, you know, he's got an essay on, you know, adapting that stuff and then seeing the screenplay and then seeing what's on screen, whatever. And then um, Misery, which was an adaptation of the Stephen King book, which again, I said, uh, my dad had a library of Stephen King stuff and there was a few things that weren't super long. The, generally speaking, the, the ones that I went after with the, Stephen, with the Stephen King things were the ones that weren't super long because I was just trying to see if I could like get into him. Um, and that was why I never finished The Stand. <laughs> I wasn't super into Stephen King, but I liked him. And I did re read a few things. And 
Misery, again, was another one to compare and contrast, like, the differences of the thing. But I did this shit when I was, like, 15 years old. Um, so it's a long time ago now. I'm 41. <laughs> so for, forgive my memory, please. <laughs> I feel like such a fraud. <laughs> like, I'm like, you sound like you're lying. <laughs> like, I was 15. I don't remember. And the more and the more I'm like, I don't remember, the more I'm like, I, I, I make excuses for how you don't remember. <laughs> I'm fucking embarrassed. It's ridiculous. My One of my best friends, Aaron, he, he remembers dialogue from these comics that he read in the fucking 70s. And I like look at him with my mouth open like, what? How the fuck? How are you remembering this? <laughs> it makes me feel so ashamed of myself. Uh, fuck you people. <laughs> Judging me. Anyway, there's four screenplays. There's also another book that he put out that I never read. Again, it was more focused on screenplay writing and I was getting into comics. Um, um, five screenplays. Um, screenplays of All the President's Men, uh, Magic, Harper, Maverick, and The Great Waldo Pepper with an essay on each. Um, and there's um, another one, which I think I read some of this um, just while I was waiting for my girlfriend in um, in like the, at Barnes and Nobles. I was just sort of waiting there, so I, I went to the William Goldman section um, and I pulled out this book and I just started reading some of the pieces and uh, and it was pretty cool. The big picture, who killed Hollywood, and other essays. Because when I was looking up different quotes and stuff, there was a bunch of things that came up that I was like, oh yeah, I read that, I remember that. Um, <clears throat> it's hard for me to remember abstract information. I, I I make lists of things like I have like quotes and stuff that from when I was a kid. But the only reason why I remember this is because I wrote them all down. And when I do cover songs, I write all this stuff down because I it kind of goes in one ear or out the other. With the basic concepts, generally speak, is sticking with me unless the general concept wasn't so interesting enough that I could remember. You know, it kind of blended into other shit. Um, so let's see. So yeah, so before I get out of here, let me just talk about some of the things that I pulled up for him that were really cool. Because this was just like cool factoids and stuff. I pulled a bunch of things up last week. And, you know, we spoke an hour about the freaking Princess Bride. And then I um, moved on with my life. So these were some quotes and stuff from him that I, I thought were awesome. And I'm going to try to jump around on uh, on some of these things but uh you know talking about hollywood william goldman said nobody knows anything and um you know and he meant this i think in a lot of deeper ways um he was very cool and diplomatic but um you know people don't trust their senses they don't trust their guts and like you know just everything is generally sort of fumbled and success is kind of accidental so often um it's um it's 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 a crazy thing um he was talking about the significance of all the president's men that uh that they felt that the release it released in 1976 that it helped to flush to the surface again all the realities of watergate that the republicans had tried so hard to bury and uh that basically it had had an effect on changing american history that movie which is pretty cool um sydney lumet Never keeps anybody waiting. No directors earned. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm like scanning. Alan is a gentleman. Um, so he, he's worked with so many different people. And um, and I mean, there's just so many diff different quotes uh, on him of like what this person was like, what that person like. Of course, all these writers, they're asking them about the other people. So so many of his quotes are insultingly not about him. My, uh, but um but awesome stuff. So, so, but this is really cool. On the persistent rumor that he and not Ben Affleck and Matt Damon is actually the author of the screenplay for Goodwill Hunting, he said, "I'd love to say that I wrote it. Here's the truth: in my orbit, it will, uh, it will say that I wrote it. People don't want to think that those two cute guys wrote it. What happened was they had the script. It was their script. They gave it to Rob Reiner to read, and there was a great deal of stuff in the script dealing with the FBI trying to use Matt Damon for spy work because he was so brilliant in math. Rob said, get rid of it. They then sent them in to see me for a day. I met with them in New York, and all I said to them was, Rob's right. Get rid of the FBI stuff. Go with the family. Go with the Boston. Go with all that wonderful stuff. And they did. I think people refuse to admit it because their careers have been so far from writing, and I think it's too bad. I tell you who wrote a marvelous script once, Sylvester Stallone. I agree. Rocky. Rocky's probably my fourth favorite movie of all time. Rocky's a marvelous script. 
God, read it. It's wonderful. It's just got marvelous stuff. And then he stopped suddenly because it's easier being a movie star and making all that money than going in your pit and writing a script. But I did not write Good Will Hunting, alas. I would not have written the It's Not Your Fault scene. I'm going to assume that 148% of the people in the room have seen a therapist. I certainly have for a long time. Hollywood always has this idea that it's this shrink with only one patient. I mean, that scene with Robin Williams gushing and Matt Damon and they're hugging. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I thought, oh God, Freud is so agonized over this scene. But Hollywood tends to do that with therapists. Anyway, I thought that was really funny and really gave like a glimpse into William Goldman and his sense of humor and, um, you know, his uh, sweet uh, diplomacy. Uh, He talked really kind words about uh, Clint Eastwood and how directors tend to lose it as they get older. But, you know, he was still going strong. Um, And he felt that um, Nanette Newman was really miscast uh, in Stepford Wives because (laughs) you wouldn't commit murder for her. Like she wasn't pretty enough to commit murder for. I really do think that this is a real thing that gets lost on people. Like there needs to be some sort of silly standard of beauty um, just for the sake of um, storytelling so that the audience understands the thing and like the shapes in the world. And that doesn't mean that we can't appreciate and know outside of that, that like there's beauty in everyone and there's beauty in everything. And like, you know, but like when you're telling stories there's just sort of like aha the one with the happy mask and the one with the sad mask and you know sometimes that means um characterizing somebody who looks good in a certain light but also sometimes it means characterizing somebody who looks good in a terrible light so i mean like you know it goes back and forth depending on the story it's all about like being able to use the trope to say something you know because you can say either thing just we just have to agree upon what the scale is the once once you start murkying up the scale and like everything is beautiful, so don't say that anything is beautiful. Well, like now we can't like speak on a lot of subjects because we have, don't have an agreed upon scale. Even though, like I said, we can have that abstract scale outside, and that abstract scale is very real. It would just you know we got to agree on it anyway. Um, do 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 do. I make a point of never reading anything I've written in rewrites. And this is a knock at the studios and the fucking notes that he gets and like all that. And I, I've had, uh, my editor speaking on Aaron Sparrow again, Aaron come back to me with rewrites for a script when we were working on the Muppets. And I literally said, I can't do it. You need to bring somebody else in to do it because it would break my heart to do it. So like, and if I had to do it, I would never, I would never read any of that shit ever again. Like the, the notes and it was just stupid. They were terrible notes. Terrible notes. Um, On directors, he says, even though we all know from the media's portrayal of them that they're men and women of wisdom and artistic vision, masters of the subtle use of symbolism, are more often than not a bunch of insecure assholes. He said, understand this, all the sleaze you've heard about Hollywood, all the illiterate scumbags who scuttle down the corridors of power, they are there all right. And worse than you can imagine. Um, And then he said something that that this seems like crazy, but it's really not crazy. uh, He said, I know an author whose book was optioned for a movie on the condition that the main character be made a much younger man. When the wind is right, I can almost hear his screams. And you build a film, a, a story or a character perfectly around the narrative. And when a subtle thing like that is changed, it it ruins all of the things that you did the things because they were the age they were. You would have thought of things differently if they were a younger age. So it's a major, major move. You know? Um... He's, it's, it's just so many good ones here. He says, some screenplays are like Jacob Marley, dead to begin with. Many more, however, are recommended or passed on within the first 15 to 20 pages. By then, a typical story analyst, script reader, or studio exec will either be hooked or bored. If he's hooked, hallelujah. If he's bored, then Houston, we have a very serious problem. You know, he's talking about the importance when it comes to if you really want to work in Hollywood and write movies that your screenplay better capture people's attention in the first 15 to 20 pages or your goose is cooked. 
And that's very true. And that like this is why I say eternal wisdom is eternal wisdom. And uh, if you're trying to work in Hollywood, I'm sure um, all of the wisdoms that are there will hold up. You know, Hollywood's never been my pursuit. So a lot of this stuff I dropped out of my brain. Um, you know, but I applied all of the storytelling uh, knowledge and you do the same thing in a comic and there is the same thing to do in a comic book script. You know, if I'm writing a script, I want to make sure I get them in the first few pages and that my editor who I've submitted the script to or whatever is interested and going to read it. Granted, usually in comics, you know, once you're being hired, you're being hired on the back of previous work that you did and it builds from there. But the very first time I, I did something, I had to hand in a script and granted it was a seven page script for Marvel Comics Presents. Um, and, you know, that had to be good. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then it, you know, built from there, you know, my career on the strength of other things that I had written. But and it's hard. It's very hard to get people to read your stuff. So, I mean, it's really a good thing to make sure that first 15 pages, you know, I mean, really, I, I just try to fucking get shit going as fast as possible. I learned from Shakespeare, start with a fight. Um, you know, that I thought that was just a, a great quote. It always stuck with me. Um in 2000, his interview on his Nobody Knows Anything quote, he said, to like to back it up further, he said, Nobody has the least idea, I believe, what will work and what won't work for audiences. Even the most successful director of all time, Mr. Spielberg, look what happened to Amistad. Do you think he thought it was going to bomb? No. They don't know. And, um, and there's a lot of truth to this. I, I do think that abstract thinkers like myself um, do have a much better idea of uh, what is going on because they're just they're too pig headed in Hollywood and they don't care about us first as they, like it should be audience first you know the customer is always right but that's not how they think and as soon as you get into any of these entertainment uh, fields you know whether it's comic books or Hollywood any of it and I've worked in all of them whether it's a voiceover actor or hosting TV shows uh, pitching TV shows um, and doing a little bit of writing uh, for film and, and TV uh, stuff, uh, you know, largely in like earlier stages with uh, p pitching, you know, working with my brother and working with other people um, that I've done narrated shows for and things like that. Um, but plenty of work to understand and, and, you know, deal with the lawyers and, and, and pitching and taking these meetings and whatnot. Uh, and, and reality TV, there's just been a lot of different angles that I've been in Hollywood. Um, I could just tell you just like sort of like where they're at and it's sort of like it's all this keeping up with the Joneses shit and like you know the least common denominator and uh, you know uh, Occam's razor and uh, just like everybody copying everybody and quick somebody's got a good idea run do the same thing over and over again like, like it's just like I won't get fired if I'm doing the thing that everybody's doing um, it's terrible and there there's this amazing system in reality that has been set up with um, novels and comic books and animation and now anime and so many other things where there is a small group of people who are willing to work for it to find out that something's great and they could be mining these things for great stuff and then at the same time trying to bring um, Hollywood talent up to that level um, and instead Things get sucked into Hollywood and they just get dumbed down and stupefied and the same shit over and over and over. I mean, it's really, it's, it's terrible. It's like, you know, because I championed all of my favorite comic books and my favorite novels being turned into book uh, movies uh, when I was a kid. And then when it happened, I was like, fuck, what did I do? Careful what you wish for. Um, the... Um, it's a shame. It's a shame what the system does to great works. And, um, you know, for all the Lord of the Rings that we have, we have like dozens and dozens of Jonah hexes, unfortunately. Um, all right. And um, let's see, just getting over here. Um, in the interview about the, oh, uh, the Ghost of the Darkness, which was my number one on the thing, he said, weren't those lines terrifying? If you can believe in the existence of evil, you can understand that story. Stephen Hopkins did a terrific job on that film, but it wasn't a great commercial success. Nobody wanted the lions to be that successful. We live in a Disney world. Maybe we miscast the lions. And then one of his best quotes, if crime didn't pay, there would be no crime. 
I love that one. Um, but yeah, it, I know the movie wasn't uh, super successful in theaters, but it's a great one, and I know it's a great film for so many people. Um, so many people line up with it. Um, on his book side of things, um, Princess Bride, Adventures in the Screen Trade, Personal View of Hollywood and Screenwriting, uh, Which Lie Did I Tell? Yeah, one of those ones is the one that I read maybe first princess bride marathon man uh magic so the, the the silent gondoliers i read that too it's an interesting one so like you know gondoliers is like the little boats in the, the thing it's um it's a short it's a short i'm kind of blanking on describing it I, i've had a hard time describing it in the past it was a cool book uh the temple of gold which is one of the ones i lost in the fire and boys and girls together which i lost in the fire but i had started reading boys and girls together that was fun it was like a comedy um color of light no, i didn't read that brothers uh baby levy number two that one's the sequel to marathon man um butch cassidy and sundance kid screenplay which I read in the four screenplay, which has a whole bunch of different screenplay stuff. Um, and it definitely doesn't say Burt Bacharach tune breaks out in the middle of that screenplay. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm just trying to look at some of his books, if there's any other ones. Yeah, Heat was cool. Um, and then he had a book called, oh yeah, Soldier in the Rain, which is the first movie that was based on. I never read Soldier in the Rain. Hype and Glory, that was the other one that burned that I never got a chance to read. I don't think I ever got my hands on Tinsel. No Way to Treat a Lady is another movie that uh, that he made that was like a crime thriller. I don't think I watched that one. Um, do, 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 do. Misery Shooting Script, Father's Day, Edged Weapons, Buttercup's Baby. Buttercup's Baby is the extra chapter for the thing. Oh, Your Turn to Curtsy, My Turn to Bow. Um, I never read that one. I think... I had switched over to more comic book reading by the time I was finishing Silent Gondolier, which was like a more more recent thing that he had read. But I did eventually dig a little bit into Boys and Girls, and um, Heat. All right. So then I got one last page open up with William Goldman. And like, there was just like, it's novels and it was books and stuff. So I didn't, like, I was like, how am I supposed to prepare for this? But at the same time, I don't know. I should have watched, like, I couldn't find, when I was trying to look for stuff, like to reminder stuff, like I couldn't find like a lot of lists and things for him. So I had to kind of go through and remind myself just based on titles and shit. And like, seriously, like most of the shit I read and watched when I was 15, 16 years old. So let's see. Um... Oh, uh, well, this is just like his Wikipedia. There was uh, some cool stuff in here that I wanted to um, to, to read. Uh, one of the things was just his self-appraisal. He was talking about, and I mean, this is maybe one of my favorite things about him, because one of my favorite things about fiction is like revenge stories. Love great revenge story. Um, and, um, and one of the other things, though, is, you know, sort of like really putting your characters through the paces. And... William Goldman does both of those really well and he talks about the second one here um, elegantly he says someone pointed out to me that the most sympathetic characters in my book always died miserably I didn't consciously know I was doing that I didn't I mean I didn't wake up each morning I think today I think I'll make a really terrific guy so I can kill him it just worked out that way I haven't written a novel in over a decade and someone very wise suggested that I might have stopped writing novels because my rage was gone it's possible all this doesn't mean a hell of a lot, except probably there's a reason I was the guy who gave Babe over to Schnell in the Is It Safe scene, and that I was the guy who put Wesley into the machine. And uh, it's reference to uh, uh, Marathon Man, the first one. Uh, I think I have a way with pain. When I come to that kind of sequence, I have a certain confidence that I can make it play because I come from such a dark corner. And, um, and he said also, I don't like my writing. I wrote a movie called Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and I wrote a novel called The Princess Bride, and those are the only two things I've ever written that I'm proud of, that I can look at without humiliation. And oh man, I feel that so strong. Uh, the, the, uh, there's only one thing that I've ever done that I consider perfect, um, and uh, maybe I will when King of Kings is all done, because I really have put the time in for that, and 
and I feel like if it's all executed right, maybe I'll feel like it came up perfectly. Or rather, rather, I think the only way I'll feel like King of Kings was perfect is if people receive it perfectly. But Blacklight District really was perfect. It came up perfect. And like, I feel that way about it. And like, I think it's great. I think it's just perfect. And a lot of it's perfect because I didn't get in the way of like the great people who were working with me, like Jason Pearson or Phil Hester, you know. I just sort of was a perfect amount of energy to help make it great. And I'm so proud of how wonderful it came out and how wonderful the music came out with Will Knox as the producer. But in general, most everything that I do, I'm like disappointed in the end result in one way or another for one reason or another. And uh, and it's such, I think it's just sort of a classic perfectionist artist thing and something that like we can all understand. And that thing with, you know, the the making people feel the pain. You know, I realize that like, if you're going to kill somebody, make them as lovable and real as possible even if they're a bastard make people understand and give them a reason to love them see how they became that way because everybody who dies everybody who suffers is lovable so like you know you have to and if you know it's like really you should be doing that for all your characters at all times so the threat is real when any day whenever whenever a danger manifests you know you want to see all these people be okay you know you need to make your audience like their mother worrying about their every move Ooh, don't get in a car you better pay attention you're in a car now sometimes in movies in cars bad things happen you know you need to keep people like honest and nervous um so you know i want to tell one last story about william goldman because i just find it to be um very funny i am the biggest william goldman fan on planet earth I'm a comic book writer. I was getting very frustrated for a long time with um, the mainstream comic book companies and, uh, you know, just all these balls that they would drop. I would really, like, set things up, like, for them to, like, just succeed. I would make things that could survive on more than just their... Um, the strength of the name of the writer, you know, stuff that was conceptually really sound. So that if you were like telling somebody the premise of the book, they'd be interested because the book's premise was interesting. And you didn't have to say, oh, it's Jesse Blaise Snyder, you know, because nobody knew who I was. So I was always giving things that were really like easy kind of like pitches. Um, but like they would, they would sort of murk it before, you know, like I had the 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 cover scheme that um was done for my evil ernie books which was just business as usual for dynamite comics and um really like nikki berucci and uh, joe rybrandt over there and um you know they they gave me carte blanche to do the thing but they made all the covers like the old school evil ernie and it would have been cool to do a single variant every issue of like an old school evil ernie with something that was more accurate to what we were doing inside the book um and um and to do some in, like to do special covers like with like you know get your comic book store manager's he severed head you know drawn onto the book you know there were some things that we really wanted to do that were outside of the box and they didn't do any of those things and it just like was very business as usual uh, and made it was a false sell because it was telling people that the book was going to look like old school chaos comics so when they went to go open it it was a new it was a different thing and um that I really believe hurt people's enjoyment of the story. Um, there were so many things, you know, uh, the Muppets, you know, they gave us all these ridiculous notes. I had to, uh, we had to add jokes to the book, which slowed down the pace of the book. Um, we added a bunch of jokes that weren't good because, you know, there's, sometimes there's jokes, sometimes there's nothing funny to say. And we were just having to make up stupid jokes. A joke in every panel was the note that we got. They destroyed my fucking book. Um, Similar things with the Toy Story. We got off to a great start with the Return of Buzz Lightyear, our first story arc. By the time issue three came out, we had to completely rewrite issue four, which was late, and like make changes to issue four because of problems with legal. And then we had to scrap the great story that I was working on called Toy vs. Machine, which was a really cool classic like John Henry versus the Steam Engine uh, kind of story with toys versus video games. It was awesome. And um, I had to scrap it, and I had to adapt some bullcrap from some like children's book that they had released it was awful 
was in such boring writing too. Um, and Disney wanted to hire me to write more stuff for them because I was good at doing the voices for the characters. But basically, I wouldn't have much choice over the stories themselves. And this is what happened with Toy Story. And by the end of it, I had to do what was essentially my most boring story concept that I had, which was Andy goes on vacation and like the toys go on vacation, almost get lost, find their way back kind of thing. And I mean, it was like fun. It was like a cartoon episode or something. It was like, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like a Toy Story film. It didn't matter. The Return of Buzz Lightyear is really great. I, I, I really, you'd, you'd like it uh, if you're a Toy Story fan. Um, and the and the story that I was working on afterwards that I was two issues into, uh, ma- uh, Toy vs. Machine. Ugh. It was going to be my masterpiece. It was so great. Um, these companies always destroy the things. And uh, so often we're left, you know, sort of like taking responsibility for what they've made <laughs> as the writers. Um, and... Um, it's uh, it's really a shame, and if we would live in a world where the writers, as the architects of the films and the comics, were being honored the right way, um, and often in comics they are, you know, great great uh, artists know that a great writer can really help them make something wonderful, um, because it's just about framing out a universe. And if you honor the great writers, the great George Lucas's and the great Jim Henson's and the great Steven Spielberg's and the great Stan Lee's of the world, you know, they have a vision, honor that vision, and we can make it that much grander. And that's just the way it is. Anyway, uh, I love William Goldman. You know, he just is the person who taught me how to write and, you know, just like my earliest reading about writing and my earliest reading of scripts to, you know, like, what is this guy doing? He's doing something right. Um, William Goldman's doing something right. All the movies that I haven't seen and books that I haven't read, I would recommend them to you sight unseen because I've never really watched or read anything by him that wasn't good. Um, Everything was good. Um, Some of them were not as memorable for me as others, but they were always great. They were always really well written um, and uh, charming um, and um, more balanced than most people. You know, uh, you know, his suspense and thrillers have laughs. Everything's got laughs. Um, you know, he wasn't afraid to uh, make you laugh in the middle of a suspenseful uh, scene. But also, his some of his suspense shit is, like, is harrowing, especially in his books. Like Marathon Man is like, because it's like all it's like to- like some torture scenes and they're, they're, oh, they're rough, 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 rough. Anyway. Um, I love you all. Thank you for joining me. Um, oh, I got really cool news. If you if you care about me and um, you want to see uh, my success in like the publishing field with my company and in future media or whatever, uh, my company, Blacklight District Studios, we've got our next comic book that's going to be going up on Kickstarter, and you can find it now on the website. Um, the book's called Fucking for Our Future, and it is a R-rated um, X-rated, probably um, comedy masterpiece. I, I love it. I'm really proud of it. It's very funny and fun, um, and uh, it's uh, it's really like turns the erotica genre on its head. I never would want to work in the erotica genre, but they were there's a lot of people making a lot of money there, and I was just sort of like, well, for my kids, I need to just sort of get a hold on a, on a, on a market here and like start to, you know capture a little bit of an audience and get some attention so we decided to do this because it was just like really outrageous and fun and we had a great time working on it the book came out awesome it's all done and uh, we've got the best covers and uh, you can go and like start start watching it it's not like live yet it'll be live probably in like the next like month or so but um fucking for our future on kickstarter follow it it's great we fulfilled all of our orders for king of kings if you haven't got it yet you'll be getting it in a little bit um probably just all our international orders probably just the, those ones are, are trickling out still uh or if you haven't got it yet there's six people who were having a problems with their addresses two of them know about it already anyway that's super cool and um i do my show on monday all your favorite bands suck uh i forget who i did this week oh i did howard ashman howard ashman writer of little shop of horrors my favorite play of all time writer of little mermaid and beauty and the beast and aladdin writer of the music awesome awesome musician i don't know who i'm gonna be doing this week uh we'll see uh, but um, you can join me this this uh, Saturday for another episode of um, Coolest Geek Alive. And um, again, this coming 
Saturday, Wednesday. What is this? See, I'm too sick to be doing a fucking show today. See, I, I just can't fucking think. Uh, so you, 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 yeah, I'm an idiot. Stop listening to me. Stop looking at me. <laughs> I love you guys. What am I saying? I'm saying that the show is over. Go away. And I'll see you next time on another fabulous episode of The Coolest Geek Alive. You've been listening to Coolest Geek Alive with me, your host, Jesse Blaze Snyder. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more excellent geek culture content. Thanks for listening. It's my favorite part!